Amen. Hosea chapter number 10. So we're going through the book of Hosea, and Hosea 10 is giving us some more um, judgment upon Israel. But we get within the judgment, we get some tidbits of the things that Israel has been doing wrong. So again, Hosea is a prophet um, during uh, Jeroboam the third. Um, Jeroboam, the third son of Jehu, sorry, he's the second Jeroboam, he, no relation to the first Jeroboam, but it's the northern kingdom of Israel. So this is a judgment, a prophet towards, um, mainly the judgment uh, towards the northern kingdom of Israel, warning them, um, of, you know, about a hundred years or so before they're actually destroyed by the Assyrian Empire. But Hosea is giving all these examples, all these analogies, and just preaching against the northern kingdom of Israel. And we see in Hosea 9, Hosea 8, all the things that God is going to do to this nation and all the warnings that God is giving. But the interesting thing is that the Bible here is giving us some characteristics of the northern kingdom of Israel as well. And that's really what I want to focus on tonight. So we're going to get through about four verses here, and then I want to focus down on one of these characteristics that this nation has and see what we can make of that. Look at verse number one of Hosea chapter number 10. The Bible says, Israel is an empty vine. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself. According to the multitude of his fruit, he hath increased the altars. According to the goodness of his land, they have made goodly images. So this is just a reference to how they took their, their plenteousness. They took their, they basically took their economy. They took their, um, their blessings from God and they used it to turn on God, right? And I've preached on that many times. Don't, uh, don't be that type of Christian. Don't be somebody that can't take a blessing in your life. Don't be this person that has to, you know, get blessed by God. You turn, you take those blessings, you turn away from God, and then God has to smack the blessings out of you, basically. And then you go through this cycle in your life. Don't be that person, all right? But that's what na this nation has done. Look at verse number two. It says, their heart is divided. Now they shall be found faulty. He shall break down their altars. Of course, these are the false gods, the golden calves um, that they put up right away in the northern kingdom of Israel. He shall spoil their images. That means their, their, you know, their idols, the things that they're worshiping besides God. Look at verse 3. It says, Now they shall say, We have no king, because we feared not the Lord. What then should a king do to us? They're basically, God is saying that you're going to get to a point where you're going to say, We have no leader and it's not going to even matter if you did have a leader because a king's not going to be able to help you at that point anyway once you're being judged. Now look at verse number four, which is what we're really going to focus on this evening. We see this really interesting verse in verse number four. It says, They have spoken words, swearing falsely in making a covenant, thus judgment springeth up as hemlock in the furrows of a field. So hemlock is like a is like a weed, right? It's like a bad thing that you don't want growing in your field. But the Bible in verse number four gives us a super interesting characteristic of this northern kingdom of Israel. So we know that this is a nation that is going to be under God's judgment. And we see, so we should look at, remember that, you know, this is a paper airplane for us right here. This is an example for us that we can look at and say, okay, we don't want to be however this nation is, this is not how our nation is. If you ever wonder, like, how is the Bible helpful? You know, how are all the, you know, the, the history, I mean, this is just history is what really we're looking at tonight. It's doctrine in history from the Word of God. But what actually is happening to this nation is historical. It's history. So how is the Bible, why tell these stories? Why tell this history? And the answer is, it's an example for us, just showing how important examples are in the Bible that God uses this philosophy everywhere. He uses it for individuals. He uses it for nations. Here we see a nation in decline. I mean, you would think if you read the Bible and you just look at all the characteristics of what Israel went through. I mean, if you remember the first time that you've read the Bible cover to cover, hopefully you've done that if you're saved. But if you haven't, you should. But if you remember the first time, the second time that you read through the Bible, do you remember having that feeling when you were reading like what the nation of Israel was doing? You're just like, man, these guys just don't get it. Like, wasn't it like a page ago that, you know, the Bible told them not to turn away from the Lord? And then like a chapter later, they're completely forgetting the Lord. And just one generation later, they completely do the exact opposite of what God told them to do. But the reason that it is in there is because these things repeat throughout history. Because men are men, period. There's no new thing under the sun. 
not with you, not with these people in the Bible. So here we see an example of a nation in decline. So it would be helpful if our nation or the people in our nation knew what the Bible said, number one, but would recognize the characteristics of a nation in decline. That would be super helpful for the United States of America if people would do that. Because literally what is happening in Hosea chapter number 10, look, and we know how this story ends. It's almost like if you know the Bible, you can see the future. Basically is what it comes down to. I mean, it just gave away the whole sermon right there. But the point is this. It's almost like God is warning us on what is going to happen. That's why he put the, these things in the Bible. Nothing is in the Bible by accident. We are being shown the consequences. And not only that, but he's giving examples of what the characteristics of a nation like this look like. I mean, God is saying, hey, don't do this. Don't be like this. And then he's saying, here are the signs of what this is. I mean, he's showing, I mean, all the signs that he's been telling us in Hosea. He's talking about, you know, idolatry. He's talking about violence. But now we see something new in verse number four of chapter 10. So we should pay attention. And here we basically see in verse number four of Hosea chapter number 10. Let's look at it again. It says they have spoken words. What does that mean? It's like they're saying stuff to each other, swearing falsely in making a covenant. So they're, they're doing what? They're making, they're making deals with each other, and then they're going back on their deals. They're breaking promises. They're breaking vows. And look, these are, these are covenants. These are, you know, legal, legal things that they are doing. They are like signing things and selling things and doing all these things. But then look at the last part of the verse. Thus judgment springeth up as hemlock in the furrows, of the field. You know, what they're, you know what the Bible is saying here? These people in this nation, you know what they're doing? They're ripping each other off and they're suing each other. That's what's happening. You see where I'm going with this? <laughs> Go to Matthew chapter number five. They're, look, they're defrauding each other. It's a nation that is just full of fraud and full. Um, they're, def, they're not defrauding Syria. They're not defrauding Edom. They're not defrauding foreign nations. They're defrauding each other. Look at Matthew chapter number five. No, look, this is a scary parallel tonight. All right, this is a scary parallel this evening because our nation is moving in this direction very, very quickly. And if you're older than, oh, I don't know, 40, you know that 20 years ago, 30 years ago, this did not be, used to be the case at all. There used to be, this did not used to be the case in this country. Look at Matthew chapter 5. Look, the Bible has a lot to say about people, you know, suing each other and taking each other to law and ripping each other off. Like, the Bible actually has a lot to say about that. Look at Matthew chapter number 5. Look at Matthew chapter number 5. The Bible says this, or Jesus says this in verse number 38. He says, you've heard that it is said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. So Jesus is saying resist not evil, meaning someone that's trying to hurt you. You know, he's, he's trying to get people to just, he's trying to get the fire to die out. He's trying to get people to stop, like, you know, retaliating against one another. Look at verse 40. And if a man will sue thee at the law and will take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Jesus here is talking about what a godly culture should look like. He's saying that a nation, look, a nation of God-fearing Christians, of Bible-believing Christians, will not have this problem where everyone is just suing everyone. That's what Jesus is saying. He's like, the, the Christians should not reciprocate this. So a nation like Israel, you know, I want to look at tonight why a nation like Israel and why a nation like us has this issue. What's the correlation? What's the correlation to a wicked nation and a nation where people just sue each other? You know, what, what is it? What does turning away from God have to do with, you know, everybody just filing lawsuits against one another? So tonight I want to look at the signs and the consequences. This is the title of the sermon. The signs and the consequences of a sue happy culture is what we're going to look at tonight. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. I'm going to give you a few points tonight on just the signs and the consequences. We'll look at the signs of it first, 
and then we'll look at the consequences of it second. All right. How do you end up with a Sue happy culture where people just want to just take each other to law left and right? Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 5 that as Christians, you should not be doing this. This should not be you. Paul follows up with this in 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, and he sees people in the literal church doing this to each other in 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. So the first characteristic of a Sue happy culture that goes against the word of God is that it's a me first culture. It's a me first culture. Really, it's a culture of narcissism. And if you don't know what narcissism is, you really need to learn about it. You need to learn about narcissism. You need to figure out what it is because our nation and people in our nation are becoming more and more narcissistic every single day. Narcissism, and I look, it's a, it's a sermon series in itself, but on this me first culture, narcissism is really an extreme focus on yourself. It's an extreme focus on yourself so much that it becomes delusional. Like someone who's a narcissist is literally delusional. They literally have a delusional view of themselves and they try to put on a fake persona for everybody else, but they're so delusional and they just believe that they, they literally believe that they can do no wrong at all. And that is a culture that is being just pushed more and more and it is growing in our nation today. And we need to recognize it. And that is not how a Christian should be at all, right? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number six. Look at verse number one. So a, a culture where everyone is, you know, inclined to take everyone, take someone to law, sue someone. You're like, well, what if I was, what if somebody ripped me off? You know, what if somebody like really did me wrong? Well, the Bible addresses that. First of all, the Bible addressed it in Matthew five. Jesus addressed it, but apparently people didn't believe Jesus. So Paul addresses it too. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number six and verse number one. So Paul has an interesting problem happening in the Corinthian church. He says, dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. So by the unjust, he's talking about people that are not saved. Okay. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? He's saying that now, I know exactly what he's saying here, but I mean, I just think about it. He's literally saying like, why are you not more equipped to judge matters than going to some outside judge or some outside um, lawyer or whatever, right? It's like, you're literally going to rule and reign with Jesus Christ in the millennial reign. It's like, you can't handle, you know, small claims court in the church. That's what Paul is saying. Look at verse three. Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? It's like, you'll, you'll be judging and ruling for a thousand years. You can't decide, you know, who owes who 20 bucks. And then if you have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to a judge who are least esteemed in the church. He said, you'd be better off, you know, giving these things to the least esteemed person in the church than to be going outside to the unsaved, is what he's saying. I speak to your shame. It is so that there is not a wise man among you. He's like, is there no one with a brain that can help you figure these things out? No, not that one shall be able to judge between his brethren, but brother go to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. He's just shaming them for doing this. Now, therefore, there is utterly a fault among you because you go to law with one with another. Why do you rather not take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? So the first thing he says, he really says two things here. He really says, like, there's an issue in the church where somebody owes somebody something or somebody thinks somebody owes them something or whatever. There's some kind of disagreement over stuff or over something that happened. Somebody got defrauded. Somebody got property taken from them or whatever. All right. Something happened. And he's saying, first of all, is there not somebody in here that can help resolve this? I mean, so he's not just saying like, just be defrauded all the time, but he's saying, look, there should be somebody in the church. He's like, even the person in the church that is the least is going to be a more righteous judge than some you know, secular person that knows no, nothing of the Bible or nothing of, of what God wants or what God's law is. But then finally, he just said, here's a real easy way to solve it. It's just let your, it'd be better to just let yourself forget about it. Oh, he owes me $20 or he did something and broke something of mine. It would be better to just forget about it and just go buy a new one and just be defrauded about it. He's not saying that nobody did anything wrong. 
He's just saying it would be better to solve it in the church or just forget about it altogether than to go out and sue one another. All right? So, I mean, look, it, it, it's someone lost money, something, something happened. You know, it's the problem is people are like, it's not going to be me that loses the money or whatever. Paul is saying you should not do that. I mean, there's plenty of deals gone bad in life. He's just saying amongst brethren, this should not happen. This is what the world does. Is just This is what the world today does. They just sue everybody for everything. I mean, I think the, probably the most popular one is like car accidents, right? There was, there was one person, one time that, look, and I'm sure somebody has been hurt in accidents and, you know, someone's going to write me an email. But the point is this. People get hurt in accidents and things are real, but then for, you know, every one you have, you know, X many, I don't even know how it is, that are just like, oh, somebody got money? I can get money too. They're like, oh, you know, my neck. Everyone's like, oh, my neck, every single time. I mean, I've been in car accidents where it was like a five mile an hour, you know, backing out of a parking space, and, and the other guy's like, oh, my neck. And I'm just like, you know, because people think I can make money this way. And it becomes a Sue happy culture. People think I can get paid for this. It's just all about me. You have no thought for anybody else. It's just this me first attitude. And Paul is saying that should not be amongst us. As a matter of fact, if somebody borrows something from me and they break it and they never return it, you know, maybe I won't borrow them stuff in the future, but I should just forget about it. I shouldn't have borrowed them something that I wasn't willing to just have broken anyway, is what it comes down to. All right? Go to Proverbs chapter number 28. The next sign of a culture like this is, you know, a, a, the next sign of a Sue happy culture. First of all, it's a me first narcissistic culture. But second point is this it's a hasty culture. It's a hasty culture. What do I mean by that? It's a culture where people want things right away, they want things now, right? It makes for a culture of people looking for a reason to make money quickly. And that is not what the Bible says. Look at Proverbs 28 and verse number 20. Proverbs 28, verse number 20. The Bible says, A faithful man shall abound with blessings. That's where we want to be, right there. That's the side of the coin in that verse we want to be on. Now let's look at the flip side of the coin. But he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. Look, it's not saying that, you know, God doesn't want you to, you know, God wants you to be poor. It's not saying that God doesn't want you to make a living. It's not saying that you can't be successful in life. What it's saying is he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. It's like he that wants to get rich quickly shall not be innocent. And that's where the, the Sue happy culture, that's all it is, is these people, they just want to, they find any reason that they can make a bunch of money quickly without doing anything. And they think that, look, any quick way to make, look, here's what you need to realize that this verse is implying in general. Any quick way to make money, to get rich, will be unjust. That's what the Bible is saying. I mean, look, there's, you know, things like maybe outside that, like maybe you get lucky or you inherit something. But in general, any quick way to make money is going to be unjust outside of an inheritance or something that was legal and, and okay, this is why people that are making haste to get rich are so easy for people to take advantage of. And these are actually the people, these people that make haste to be rich, many times they're the people that end up being completely broke because they're the ones that, the people that know that they're out there, the scammers and the, you know, the people running pyramid schemes and multi-level marketing. I mean, this is the kind of person they're after right here. Like, we have a way to, where you can make $15,000 a month without doing anything, right? Or whatever, right? I mean, haven't you ever been on, like, some blog or something and somebody just puts that, like, can thing or whatever? But anyway, the point is, God's not going to bless it. Even if you did fall into, if you did sue somebody and made a bunch of money like that, God is not going to bless that type of thing. Because for a Christian, God cares how you do things. God, the means don't justify the end for the Christian. For people in the world that they do, but for us, it matters how we get there, right? Look, it, you, it doesn't mean you can't be smart. 
It doesn't mean you can't be successful, that you can't have a good idea, that you can't start a business and you can't, you know, grow that business or, you know, get some skills that really pay you a lot of money or whatever that is. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But anyone who started a business or gained skills or did anything will tell you one thing. It wasn't hasty. It wasn't quick. Most people that have made it will tell you that it took them a long time and a lot of work to make that just gain. All right. But look, the problem is, is this hasty culture, especially in our country today, people only care about the results. And if doing this thing, if suing this person, if I have an opportunity to sue this person, it, if it gets me the things that I want, it's okay. And many times they'll think, well, I'm going to do such great things when I get this money from, you know, this lawsuit or whatever it is. So all I have to do is make this fake claim or do all this and whatever. And I'm just going to do so much good with this money. No, God is not going to bless that type of thing. Not for the Christian. Look, in America today, by the way, it's just everything is, needs to be right now. It's a huge problem in our culture. Like the next generation's coming up. You know, Gen Z and what, Gen A, is that one now? But they, they think they need to have everything that their parents had right away. It's just not possible. It's not possible. You need to be patient. You need to be smart. You need to follow, you know, the, the advice that the Bible gives you. You need to work hard. The Bible would say you need to be diligent, which means you need to work hard for not just a week. You need to work hard for years and years and decades and decades. And then it's possible still, folks, to succeed in this nation as it sits today. Look, be patient, be smart, work hard. You'll do just fine. But you can't have everything right now. So to look at people that maybe have been working for a long time and be like, oh, you know, I, I need to, you know, be where they're at. What are you talking about? Don't have this, I need to be every, you know, don't have this hasty attitude that this country is pushing on everybody. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. So it's a me first culture. It's a hasty culture that sues everybody left and right. And guess what? Here's the second one, or the third one, sorry. It's a me only culture. Because when you're actually suing somebody and you're taking someone to law like they were doing in Hosea chapter number 10, see, people that do this today, whether they're ripping off some system, whether it's ripping off some, you know, I don't know what kind of entitlement systems that are being ripped off. I can't tell you how many stories I know for a fact where people ripped off hundreds of thousands of dollars from like the COVID relief. It was ridiculous. It was, it was open in your face fraud. Just like, but it's just the government. So free money. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that in my life. It's free money. I had a roommate in college that lived, I, I, I'm telling you, he lived like a king in college. We were poor. Like, we were living on 20 bucks a week. I don't even know how that's possible now. But we were living on nothing, and this guy just had so much money. But he just took out all these loans. And I was just like, how do you have so much money? He's like, it's free money. It's just free money. Because he, he meant that because it was interest only. Or it was, it, it was interest free for, I don't know, some certain period of time until you graduate or whatever. That guy's living in Nicaragua right now. I'm not kidding. Like, he just, like, snapped and, like, left this really good job. And he's like, I'm going to Nicaragua. I'm like, Nicaragua? Like, do you, have, you, have, you, have you Googled that just, like, for five minutes? 2 Timothy chapter number 3. It's a me-only culture. Again, more narcissism. Narcissism, again, one of the characteristics of it is there's just no regard for the feelings of others at all. No regard. Look at 2 Timothy chapter number 3 as it relates to, you know, the end times, perilous times, how men will be in the end times. Verse number one, it says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be what? Lovers of, them, of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. But look at that, lovers of their own selves. Every time somebody rips somebody off or sues somebody unjustly or, you know, find some fraudulent way to rip off an insurance company or whatever it is. So look, everyone thinks that this money just comes from nowhere. But somebody always has to pay. There is no such thing 
as free money. So every single time that somebody is ripping someone off or suing somebody for a fraudulent reason, they are hurting other people. And it's just so easy for people to justify doing that. I mean, you know, money never comes from thin air. I mean, unless you're the federal government, but really even the federal government, they're, they're ripping you off. They're slowly ripping you off. They, you just don't even know. They're just quietly robbing you. Even that money doesn't really come from thin air. They're just quietly robbing every single person in the country. Don't get me started on that. But look, a lot of people are like this too. A lot of people, when they sue somebody or they make some fraudulent claim against their company or whatever it is, they're just like, you know, well, it's a big company. It's a big corporation. They have millions of dollars or billions of dollars or whatever. They just give me some. But look, those corporations, look, and don't get me started on corporations. I don't think corporations are, are just and a moral thing in general. But the point is, they're not paying for that. They're passing that off to the people. They're passing all that money off to the people that they do work for, that they sell things to, whatever it is. Everyone has to pay more and more. This is why this I got mine attitude is just going to destroy the whole fabric of our country. And that's why insurance rates are through the roof. You know, all kinds of rates of everything are just going through the roof because everybody has this I got mine attitude when it comes to frivolous things like this. It's selfish and it's anti-Bible. And Christians should have no part of it. But look, it's, it's pushed. This, this me first or me only culture is pushed in everything today. I mean, just think of how many times you've been like, well, you need, to, you need to be true to yourself. I've heard that out soul winning so many times. Usually people smoking a lot of marijuana. <laughs> like, you know, you ask them, you want to hear the gospel? You know, what do you think? You think you'd go to heaven? All this kind of stuff. And they're just like, just trying to be true to myself, bro. Like people, but people are pushed. They're told this. They're taught this philosophy that you need to, you, you need to take care of you. You need to take care of you first. But you know what? That kind of you first or me only attitude, that, just, that can like justify literally every kind of evil. Turn to Philippians chapter number two. Look, that can justify every single kind of evil from, from divorce, oh, I just need to take care of me, to, to literal murder. I mean, what is the number one reason for abortion today? Well, I just need to take care of me. I just wasn't, I wasn't ready. I, 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 I. Me first. Murder. It justifies everything. But the Bible does not teach you first. The Bible does not teach you only. The Bible teaches the opposite. Philippians chapter 2, look at verse number 4. So you can't just grab, you know, you get in a car accident or whatever it is, and you have some opportunity. Look, the Christian is supposed to see that opportunity. It used to be a shameful thing to get entitlements. It used to be a shameful thing to try to, you know, rip somebody off, rip some insurance company off, or do some kind of fraud. Fraud used to be shameful. Now it's so common that people are literally like, you get in an accident, oh, you're going to get some money for that? And if people do get money for that, they're literally bragging about it. And look, I'm not saying if somebody has a legitimate injury or something. That's not what I'm saying. But every single time you get in an accident in the Walmart parking lot, you don't need $20,000 because your neck hurts. The Christian is supposed to look at those opportunities and put them aside and say, no, I will not commit fraud. I will not take this unjust gain. Even if it costs you some money, the Lord is able to give you much more than this, folks. Look at Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 4. The Bible says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Now, does that say forget yourself? Does that say you should just go out and just like commit self-harm to help people? No, it says also on the things of others. It says that you should, I mean, it says you should think of other people. It says you should consider other people when you do things. I was asking my, my wife uh, some examples. I'm like, do you have some examples of this? She had a really good one. And especially, it's, it's very applicable to California. Like, I don't know what is wrong with California drivers. But think about this for a second. You're on a two-lane highway, and you just you want to get ahead. You want to get one car ahead, so you're going to risk the lives of, you know, 10 people that you don't even know, you never even met, 
so you can save five seconds. I have never seen so many people do that anywhere else in the country. It is insane in this country or in this state. Maybe it's just this county. I don't know. But people take insane risks on the road here. And look, they're not just taking. I mean, I've told Jacob that many times when we're driving and we see this on one stretch of road, Highway 41, one stretch of road. And we see this all the time, literally cars like running people into the ditch because it, to avoid a head on collision. I've seen it more than more than five times. And I just told you, I always tell Jacob, like, it's so selfish. Like, they're literally just, like, risking that person's life. Like, if you don't drive in the ditch, you're going to die. And somebody else made that decision for you. They're not considering anybody except themselves. They're not considering how their actions might affect other people at all. I mean, the Bible here is just saying, it's not saying forget yourself. It's not saying, hey, just, you know, be this person that goes out and just let yourself be, you know, taken advantage of and just abused and whatever. It's like, hey, you know what? When you, do, when you take action in your life, consider other people. Think about how your actions are going to affect others. I mean, this isn't, you know, this isn't rocket science here. Turn to Proverbs chapter number 11. And here's the biggest one. Here's the biggest problem and the biggest issue with this Sue happy culture and the, the biggest danger, in my opinion, for our nation as we see this taking hold in America, the same thing that's happening to the nation of Israel. Look at Proverbs chapter number 11. Proverbs chapter number 11, look at verse number 1. We're going to look at verse number 1, then we'll look at verse number 3. But verse number 1 says this. It says, A false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. So the Bible is saying that, that God hates when someone is cheated. I mean, abomination means God hates it. So when somebody cheats somebody or somebody defrauds somebody, so if you're that person that comes into the church and you're like, yeah, no one can sue me here. And I'm just going to take it. Look, and this happens. This happens more than I would like to see it happen in churches because you can come into this church and you can take advantage of these people because the person with a lot of problems is going to come into this church, and maybe they've got all kinds of issues in their life. You know what? They're going to have friends here. People are going to love them, and people are going to want to, you know, help them, you know, get on their feet and their life. And you know what? Those people that are willing to help, they're not going to sue you. They're going to allow themselves to be defrauded. Those are some pretty easy people to take advantage of. And that happens in a church. And I try to police that. I try to guard from that as much as I can, you know, allowing people to be that Christian brother, that Christian sister, but not allowing people to just come in here and just like defraud the church. But here's the thing, folks. That person may think that they're getting away with things by, you know, getting someone to do something for them or giving someone to borrow them money or whatever it is, but they're not really getting away with anything because God hates what they're doing. And I would much rather have somebody steal 40 bucks from me then have God hate what I'm doing. Because I want to be on God's right side. If that cost me, if that cost me 40 bucks, if that cost me a, a broken car or whatever, like, no problem. No issue there. Nobody's getting away with anything, okay? Because a, a God hates a false balance. He hates it when people rip people off. But a just weight is his delight. He loves it when you allow yourself to be defrauded. He loves it when you do something right for somebody, when you follow through on a promise for somebody, when you follow through on something that you said you would do for somebody. Look at verse number three. It says, the integrity of the upright shall guide them, but the perverseness of transgressor, transgressors shall destroy them. So don't think anybody's getting away with anybody, anything. You know, a lot of times it can upset you, be like, oh, people just, you know, some people just take advantage because like some people just live their life to take advantage. But they're not, they're not getting away with anything. They're on, the, they're, on the left, they're on the right side or the left side of this verse right here. They're the perverseness of transgressors. And it will destroy them, the Bible says. You want to be the integrity of the upright. But the, main, the, the, the third point, or the fourth point, I'm sorry, is this. And speaking to Proverbs chapter number 11, is a Sioux happy culture or a culture like we see in Israel and a culture like we're starting to see more and more in the United States today is a, dis, is a distrusting culture culture. It is a culture, look, and this is something that is very, very dangerous. 
It is something that will literally destroy a society. Look, the more, look, the closer to God, look, don't, don't miss this. The closer to God a nation is, the more trusting that nation will be of each other, of the people in that nation. Look, I should be able to go on Craigslist and I should be able to go and buy something on Craigslist without having to worry about being robbed or killed or whatever, or having to take, you know, someone with me that's armed to, you know, to make some kind of deal on a, on a, on a tool. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it's almost to the point where it's almost not worth buying something on certain places, on certain sites because of the risk involved. Because if you just do it enough times, something bad is going to happen to you. I mean, the, the scams out there. I mean, literally, if you were to buy a car on Craigslist, I've been, I mean, I've been sold a bad car myself. But literally to the point where you need to buy a vehicle, a used vehicle today, you have to know everything about that vehicle. You need to know, like, what kind of model it is. You need to know, like, all the options that it has and all the different, you know, features of that. Because people will just try to fake stuff. And they'll try to sell you something that looks like it's something that it's not. They'll sell you something with problems. How many times have you heard people say, oh, I got this car, and it's got this horrible problem with it? What is, what is the first advice that they usually get from somebody in the room? You need to sell that thing. What are you talking about? The engine's about to explode. It already has exploded. And the answer is, go sell it to some fool that doesn't know the engine's about to explode. That's a common thing. People do that all the time. As a matter of fact, if you look at some, you know, you almost can't look at the best deal on some site for something because you know it's some kind of scam. It, somebody's just trying to entice you and trap you into things. But the point is, it's a society that is losing trust very quickly. You literally can't trust anyone in a society like this. I mean, nobody trusts anybody anymore for good reason. I mean, it seems like even normal people are falling into this. And guess what, folks? As soon as trust goes away, when trust goes away completely, society will completely collapse because society cannot function without some level of trust. Let me give you an example. I, I, got, some, I got something in my pocket here, or I did have something. I just dropped it on the floor. But what is this? This is a $5 bill. If I go to the gas station, somebody will give me a gallon of gas for this. Why? It makes no sense. This has no value. It's a crumpled up piece of paper that's dirty and sweaty, and I feel like I even need to wash my hands just from touching it. It's completely worthless. But why would someone accept this for a gallon of gas. And the only reason that they would do that is because of trust. You say, trust in what? Trust in the federal government? Nobody trusts the federal government. That's true. It's not because of trust in the federal government. It's actually trust in you. The only reason they will accept this is because you are going to get up and you are going to go to work tomorrow. It's trust in the American economy, which is you. It's trust in the American people to get up and go to work and make things, build things, and produce things. Without that, this is worthless. Or nobody would trust it, even though it is worthless. So as soon as trust goes away, the whole thing falls apart. What happens if this, literally, all the trust is gone and no one will accept this at all tomorrow? What do you think the city's going to look like out here? The point I'm trying to make is this. When trust goes away, the society will collapse completely when the trust is gone. And trust is falling off a cliff right now. And that's what you see in Hosea chapter number 10. These people couldn't even trust each other because they're just ripping each other off. They're suing each other. They're just taking each other to law. And the Bible is telling us again and again and again, but that shouldn't be you. Which means what? We should be able to trust each other, number one. So look, we see the obvious parallels here with this nation and our nation. You say, what can we do from that? Because look, our airplane is looking very similar to Hosea chapter number 10's airplane. 
So society is going the same place. It's selfish. There's no trust, or the, the tr there's not no trust, but trust is going away. So what are the lessons? What's the application? What can we take from this? And the answer is two things. Two things is this. What can we as Christians, because look, knowing the Bible should help you in your life. Knowing the Bible, you shouldn't fall into the same holes as everybody else. Knowing the Bible, you should be able to be 10 steps ahead of everyone that is just out in society walking around blindly. So how can we apply this to our lives? The first, the first lesson that I would say tonight is this. Be careful. Be careful. Don't be irresponsible. Realize that you are walking around. I mean, look, don't go walking around in this society with no car insurance. Don't go walking around in this society with no health insurance. I got all bent out of shape with, with somebody a few months ago because they're driving around with no driver's license and they're driving around with no car insurance and they're, you know, they're just, I'm just like, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? And look, the reason I got bent out of shape is because I care about this person. And I was trying to be like, hey, this is not a wise thing that you're doing. Why? Because you're going to get in trouble. You're going to get put in jail. You, someone's going to sue you. You're going to hurt somebody. You're going to kill somebody. And then you're going to be liable. Literally, you could ruin your entire life by doing what you're doing. You get arrested or, or you know, picked up for not dry, having not a license. Now you can't get a license. Now you're one of these guys that can't get a job because you don't have a driver's license. You know what that's called? A loser. Well, I can't drive anywhere, so I can't work. And, you know, it just, it's a snowball effect. You cannot do that. Don't be irresponsible is the first lesson. Realize what we're dealing with out here. You're not dealing with just people. You're not walking around outside this church in this world, you know, walking around with just people that are going to suffer themselves to be defrauded. No, they're looking for any crack, any advantage, anything that they can do to defraud you. You need to, you need to protect yourself. Trust but verify. That's number two. That's number two. Look, if you just go and you just trust everybody out in this world here, I think you should be able to trust people. But if you go out and just trust everybody, this society is going to chew you up and spit you out. If you let it. But here's the, the second main point. Turn to Proverbs chapter number 22 that you can take away from this. So the first one, the first main point that you can take away is just be careful. Be careful. Be responsible. Know what you're dealing with out there. Trust but verify. Cover yourself. You know, look, I, I don't know. I have so much insurance. I don't even know how much insurance I have. I'm like, why do we have this insurance? We have insurance. I mean, what do you have insurance on? Your cars, your house, health care. I don't even think you can not have health care insurance anymore, right? But the point is this. There used to be a lot of people that didn't have health care insurance. And look, that's not a wise thing. Because one thing, especially when, you know, going and, and getting a, a, you know, whatever, they, they give you a Band-Aid. It's like 80 grand. I mean, one small thing can financially ruin you if you didn't have health insurance. You have to cover these things for yourself and your family. You have to be careful. But the second thing is this. Look at Proverbs chapter number 22. Proverbs chapter number 22. The second thing that we need to take away from this is just this. Be a Christian. Meaning there's a Sue Happy environment out there. People are defrauding each other left and right, but that should not be us. We should not take part in all of that. Don't be part of the problem. Deal fairly with people. I mean, if there's a question, you take the fraud. And look, I'm not against, I'm not against Christians, I mean, church members doing business with church members. That will happen. I think that's a good thing as long as caution is exercised. I think it's a good thing I mean, we've had church members that work for other church members. We've had, I mean, I have church members that have done work or doing work for me that I work with and, and I help. But look, there's very, you know, there is important things to be considered when you go into business with somebody in the church. And that is, you just need to be sure that you can take the fraud. So when you go into business with somebody in the church, you need to just be sure that like, hey, you know, I'm going to make sure that I'm going into business with my brother on this, 
either he's going to work for me or I'm going to work for him or we're going to work together, whatever it is, you should have the mindset that I'm going to get the short end of the stick. I'm going to make sure my brother gets the long end of the stick. If there's three pieces to get divided up, he gets two and I get one. And as long as you do that and those clear lines and you're always and both of you, that's how you end up with somebody who sells a car to somebody in the church and they're negotiating the price and one person is saying, I'll pay the person more and the other person is saying, the owner who's trying to sell it is trying to give them a, a less. It's like this backwards weird thing. It's like, no, I'll give you, you know, $200. And he's like, no, I'm going to sell it to you for $100. Yeah. It's, it's like, that's how it should work. That's how business works in the church because everyone is considering the other person. And that's how it can work. And look, it can be a very great thing, and it should be a great thing, but just caution should be taken. The Bible gives us some guide rails here. Look at verse 26 of Proverbs 22. Verse 26 of Proverbs chapter number 22. Be not thou one of them that strike hands. Here you got people making deals, right? Or of them that are sureties for debts. The Bible says in verse 26, be careful with deals in the first part of that verse. Be careful with what you promise. Be careful with what you vow. Maybe people were more careful with what they vowed and they just let their yay be yay and their nay be nay. They wouldn't enter into so many deals that they end up breaking or defrauding people on. But the next part of this verse is this, or of them that are sureties for debts. You know what that's saying? It's saying don't co-sign for people. It's saying don't sign you know, something that would give somebody, get somebody else a loan or, you know, take on somebody else's debt, or whatever that is. And then look at verse 27. It tells you what will happen. It says, if thou hast nothing to pay, why should he take away thy bed from under thee? So the Bible is saying in these two verses, if you go and you sign for somebody else's debt and you can't pay it, they're going to come and take away your stuff. So the Bible is warning you here not to do this. And look, a couple of times in the last few years, I have been asked to do this. And look, I wanted to do it. I wanted to do it because I wanted to help the person. And it was a really big deal, and, and it really would have helped them, but I just defaulted to this verse. And I just said, look, I just can't be a surety for debts. The Bible literally tells me not to do it. So I just listened to God's word and not my own feelings and not what I wanted to do, and let me tell you something. Thank goodness I didn't. If you want to give somebody something, give somebody something. If you want to help somebody out, if you want to give somebody 500 bucks, give it to them. But don't be a surety for somebody else's debt. Don't strike hands on that deal. Look, the Bible even warns about your debt. Definitely don't be taking on other people's debts. Because look, I mean, Dave Ramsey will tell you this. Like, there's a reason they got that debt in the first place. There's a reason that they need somebody else. You know how easy it is? You know how easy it is to be a surety for debt? That's it. You don't have to move a dollar from a checking account. For me to be a surety for debt or for somebody to be a surety for somebody else's debt, all you have to do is sign a piece of paper. That's it. It's super easy. But it's super dangerous for you because they're coming they're going to take away your bed when that person defraud, defaults on that debt or whatever it is. So the Bible's warning us. So the Bible is saying like, hey, you know, it's okay to do business. Just be the one that gets the short end of the stick. You'll be fine if you do that. But it's saying, you know, don't be going and doing things like that. All right? So look, here's the bottom line tonight, folks. As Christians, we know stuff. We know what's happening to this nation. We see what's happening to our nation. We know this. We should be smarter. We should be better because we know the Bible. I mean, we should be more prepared than someone who has no idea what the Bible says or doesn't even believe the Bible. Look, Israel is a paper airplane is what it comes down to in this chapter. And they're this, they're this kind of paper airplane. They're this one. And we should look at it and say, you know what? I don't want that airplane. I'm going to listen to what the Bible says. Even when I, I feel and I want to do something, just listen to what the Word of God says. And everything's going to work out for you. Let's bow our heads and have a word of